Hi, Martin Turner here. This week we look at equity. Unlike the other four elements of accounting, we account for equity very differently depending on the type of structure the business uses. We will focus on accounting for equity in companies. And we'll look at the video, Two Parts of Equity, as we look at accounting for equity in companies. We will also look at some key concepts involved with accounting for investments in other companies. These concepts will be foundational for our study of this in much greater depth for intermediate and advanced financial accounting. And we'll look at the video, Investments in Other Companies, as we look at these key concepts. Let's start by looking at how we account for equity in companies. Welcome everyone uh, and welcome to our lecture on equity. Um, in this uh, lecture we'll see that unlike uh, the other elements of accounting, we account for equity very differently depending on the uh, structure of the business and we'll be focusing on how we account for equity in companies. And another key thing that we'll be doing is we'll be looking at how we account for investments in other companies. Companies are often invariably investing in other companies. And this, the key concepts we look at today will be foundational, foundational for um, the intermediate financial accounting and advanced financial accounting, where you will look in much greater detail the technical complexity particularly around how we account for investments in other companies, but also how we account for equity is, uh, is very technically uh, complex. So we'll be kicking off with this very exciting area. And Maria, might, her favourite financial statement may be the statement of cash flows. But I think my, fa my favourite element in how we do accounting would have to be equity, I would think. It's, it is so complex. So what we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at three parts to equity, or is it two parts to equity? And uh, issued capital and reserves, and we'll see that retained earnings are, are, are simply another form of reserves. And we'll have a look at the video, two parts to equity. And then we'll do a few more things about equity, goodwill, dividends, other comprehensive income, we'll look at, at those aspects. Then we'll have a look at investments in other companies, and we'll also look at the video on investments in other companies. Then we'll have the minute paper and a summary. We'll also be taking some time to do the formal student evaluation today. So feel free to do it at any time during the lecture, but we'll, we'll take a bit of time out towards the end. On the student evaluations, I encourage you to do your student evaluations for all your units each term. Now there are some great videos on equity and uh, I thought we'd have a look at one of them here which is called Two Parts to Equity. And is it three parts or two parts? If you would like to know more about how we account for equity in companies, this video will help you understand some of the key concepts so that you can use this foundation in later units in your degree. How we account for assets, liabilities, revenue and expenses is generally the same regardless of which form of business organisation our firm uses, whether it is a sole trader, partnership, company or trust. However, the way we treat equity is very different depending on our form of business organisation. In this video, we will focus on how we account for equity in companies. The amounts of each type of equity are included in a firm's balance sheet each year. And various information is also included as footnotes in the financial statements. In addition, equity is a bit special as it has its own financial statement, the Statement of Changes in Equity. For a company, 
there are two main components of equity in the balance sheet, issued capital and reserves. And a particularly important type of reserve, which is not even called a reserve, is retained earnings. Issued capital is required to be shown separately for companies. It shows the amount of assets invested in a company by its shareholders. But this is not all there is to equity. Reserves are also required to be shown separately. Although reserves are required to be disclosed, nowhere in the Accounting Standards, Conceptual Framework or Corporations Act are reserves actually defined. So we will use this definition of reserves. Reserves are those parts of equity not represented by issued capital. Reserves represent increases in the value of the net assets of a business over time that have not been distributed to equity investors but retained in a business to support its growth. Reserves can be set up based on transfers directly to equity from other comprehensive income or from transfers from retained earnings. In another video, we will look at the rather special type of reserves, retained earnings, into which all the net profits of a firm are transferred at the end of the year. One thing to be clear about is that reserves do not mean the company has cash in its bank account backing these reserves. An asset revaluation reserve is a reserve many firms can have. It represents the increases to fair value of property, plant and equipment or of intangible assets. When we revalue them, to fair value. For further information on two parts of equity, go back to Chapter 8, Section 8.1 in the Study Guide and also review the Equity Weekly Questions. Also answer, write and rate questions on equity in Peerwise. So there we have it, the two parts to equity. What are the two parts to equity? Reserves and issued capital. Reserves and issued capital. Dan and I have said that here in Rockhampton. Um, there were a number of these little short videos. And uh, uh, it has, did anyone, has anyone seen that video before? Has anyone looked at that particular video? No? Kelly, did you see that video? I have seen it before, Martin, yes. You did see it. Was, yes. it, good this, was it good the second time? Yes, I'll, and a third and a fourth. <laughs> I'll just keep watching it. <laughs> yeah. So Kelly's watching the videos. Is, has anyone else seen that video before? So I'd encourage you um, uh, to look at the sh videos. It's often short videos in numbers of units but also um, there can be longer ones. Maria's are always very popular, her long videos, focused on assessments and stuff like that often. So, uh, and uh, uh, did, uh, who's read the reading for this week, the study guide? Mm -hmm. Diana has? Just uh, not the whole thing. But you read half enough, of half of it, to get, yeah. th get through the KCQs, isn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. has, who else has read the reading? No one here in Brisbane, Martin. Oh, you haven't read the reading? Oh, haven't we done the... Oh, you haven't submitted your KCQs for it? No, I didn't. No? no? Or did not have it? Well, you know, um, quite a few people do the readings where we have um, the steps, you know, before class. And uh, But we don't do it with the videos. People don't do it. One of the key reasons large numbers of students around the world at university are failing to learn properly, whatever they're studying, particularly science and 
business and stuff, is not preparing for class. So we show a few of the videos in class, but um, uh, you know, a very good practice to to come to class prepared. So I just showed you that little video as an example of the sort of things you can watch before you come on each of the weeks. And so that topic, that, that video was called Two Parts to Equity. And here I've got three parts to equity. So have we got two parts or three parts? Uh, issued capital, reserves and retained earnings. So we can see it as sort of three parts or two parts. And the key here is that the way we account for equity is different, dramatically different, depending on the business structure of the organisation we're doing accounting for. We're focusing on accounting for companies. That's a particularly complex area. And, uh, and in, in AASB 101, there's actually an accounting standard called 101. This is on presentation. And uh, in Power 54R, there's uh, some requirements on how we present equity. And so we'll go down to Power 54R. And um, it's page 15 for... Got to find page 15 here. We've gone too far. Okay, page I'm 13. It is so small on that screen here. Ah, here we are. So you can see that the statement of financial position, there's various requirements on how presentation was shown. And, uh, and you can see this is why our, one of the reasons why a lot of our financial statements can look a bit similar is there are some requirements. If you go to 54R, issued capital and reserves attributable to owners of the parent. The parent is the company who's presenting their accounts. And so it's a requirement that we show two elements of equity, issued capital and reserves. And reserves are completely undefined in the accounting standards and in the conceptual framework. So we've got a Martin definition for reserves, which you can use. And, uh, um, and it's two parts or three parts to equity because the requirements in the accounting standards are for two parts, equity, uh, 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 issued capital and reserves. But there's a very special form of reserves called retained earnings, and that's where all our profit comes from the income statement. And uh, uh, that's a key reserve for all our firms. So we often think of it as, as, a, as three parts to equity. And... Um, So issued capital are the amounts of assets that have been invested in the company by its shareholders. For Ryman Healthcare, that's about $33 million. That's the amount actually contributed by shareholders. Just go to the page. So there you can see issued capital, 33, so small, 33, 33.29. That's how much, that's how much cash or other assets the equity investors have put into Ryman Healthcare throughout its life. A certain amount of that, I think about 15 million, was raised when it floated. And my children and wife contributed towards that 15 million. That's it. That's all the equity investors have contributed to the business. Its total equity today is 2.17 billion. Let's say 2.2 billion. <laughs> Yet the issued capital is just 33 million. So highly successful companies will generate a lot of value for equity investors. They'll typically also generate a lot of value for other stakeholders in a business, customers, staff, suppliers, the 
general environment from the community and government and so on. But there's a lot of value add just in the accounts. The market cap of Ryman Healthcare is over six and a half billion dollars. Yet we can see the issue capital, which is the amount the equity investors have contributed to the business is 33 mil. It then has various other items, which are all various types of reserves. And, uh, and it also has some, um, it, it also owns some shares in itself. So you'll be able to have a look in the tutorial part today at the, at the, um, at your company's equity and reserves. But that's Ryman's situation. Now reserves are those other items of equity other than issued capital, which isn't much of a definition, so I've given you mine earlier on in the to the video. Retained earnings is one type of reserve, but it's a particular one. So we often can think of it as being three types of equity because retained earnings is such a key reserve. But the idea of reserves is that some of the value add that's been created in the business is retained in the business to support future growth and the development of the business. And so what can happen is that um, the profits can be transferred to retained earnings at the end of the year. Uh, remember, with revenue and earnings and, and expenses, revenue expenses are all transferred to a P&L account at the end of the year, and the balance of that P&L account is then transferred to retained earnings at the end of each period. And so revenue and expense accounts are zero at the beginning of each year. And their, their net balances are transferred to equity um, via retained, into the retained earnings of equity. Now, what can happen is money from retained earnings can then be transferred to other reserves or, um, uh, and also elements of other comprehensive income. That is the income that's not part of the profit and loss, not part of the income statement, but the comprehensive income statement, the other comprehensive income, that can be transferred directly to some of these reserves. And we'll have a look at that. So in terms of journals, when we're taking them out of retained earnings and putting it to reserves, that's creating reserve by appropriating profits out of retained earnings. We credit retained earnings and, oh, wait a second, what's happened here? No, we don't. We debit retained earnings because we're reducing equity and we credit reserves. So that should be off to the right. When we increase equity, is it a debit or a credit? You'd like to tell me. Right. Increase in equity, is it a debit or a credit? Credit. Huh? Credit. Diana just said that so quickly, credit. How did you, how did you know that? Right side is credit. Uh, the right hand side of the equation is credit. <laughs> the right hand side of the equation uh, is increases are credit. credit. That's right. So, and when we're reducing equity, it is a debit. So with debit retained earnings, credit reserves. You need to have all that sorted out by now. You need to be able to do just like Dayanara did now. If you haven't got on top of that, you need to get on top of it before you do any more account. And um, so we transfer out of retained earnings into reserves, but also other reserve, various reserves can have other comprehensive income transferred through it. Some of this is dealt with in some of the other short videos. Now, so retained earnings is a special type of reserve. It's the amount of profits after tax, tax is just an expense like everything else, that's earned by the company and retained in the business. So we can, uh, we can pay dividends out of retained earnings, so we can distribute it to shareholders, but what we don't distribute, what's left is um, retained earnings. So why do we keep retained earnings? And so if we looked at Ryan Milkier's balance sheet's got a lot of retained earnings and a lot of reserves, obviously, because it has very little issued capital. So our first question, why do we keep retained earnings separate from issued capital? Why would we want to do that? Isn't it all just equity?
one response. Just why do we want to have it? It's alright. It's not a speed, speed dial thing. So just pop in your thoughts. Why? It, it, you know, it's, it's actually a big deal in the in the presentation in ASB 101. They make a point of showing issue. You're required. You're required under the account standards to show issue capital and reserves separately. Retain is a, is a key reserve. So why would why, why would we want to do that? But two responses. Just just. You'd say, I have absolutely no idea, or wouldn't it be better just to lump it all together? But, um, or, or say so whatever you like. Two people. Maria, would you like to discuss the responses? Yeah, sure, Mark. Okay, uh, so we've just got two responses here. Oh, three now. Um, so why do we keep retained earnings separate from issued capital? The first response is because issued capital is for shareholders and is for the business. Second response is we have to pay for dividends from retained earnings but not from issued capital. And the third response says issued capital are the investments from owners while retained earnings are the profit that is transferred from the income statement. <laughs> All right. So, what do you make of that, Maria? I think they're um, developing insights. Developing insights? <laughs> well, well, two of them are sort of just saying what issued capital and retained earnings are. So, but the second one talks about how we take dividends out of retained earnings, but not out of issued capital. So, companies, companies have a separate legal entity and there's no recourse to shareholders. If Ryman Healthcare goes broke and can't pay, you know, its, its builders and what have you, or can't meet its, its commitments to its customers, then my children and wife, they, they don't have to chip in any more money. They have no, no obligations beyond the money they've contributed in the issued shares. My wife and children, they bought in the float. So they paid money. They didn't buy their shares from anyone else. They bought it from the company and they gave their money, their proportion of the 33, of the 15 mil that was raised on the float. They gave their proportion of that to the company and that's it. So that's the issue of capital. And so people, if you're, if you are lending money to a business or dealing with it, um, that issue of capital can't be given back to the shareholders. It's only 33 mil for Romans. But any of the retained earnings uh, can be. The dividends can be paid out of retained earnings. If a company transfers money from retained earnings to a reserve, that is, it's really signalling to the market that it's not planning on distributing that amount. Ryman's has got pretty big retained earnings over the year. But, um, yeah, so that's one of the reasons. It sort of separates and shows where companies can... Um, uh, pay dividends to, sh to their equity investors and the amounts from which they can't draw. And that gives some sense of the company's sort of financial um, capacity. Now, there's more about equity than just issued capital and reserves, or if you like, issued capital reserves and retained earnings. There's also, uh, we're going to look at some other areas of equity, which is goodwill, dividends, and also the effect of other comprehensive income. Now, there's quite a few misconceptions about goodwill. Um, some people think it is an intangible asset, but goodwill is not an intangible asset. Here we are talking about assets when we're talking about equity, and we'll explain what we're doing that for. But goodwill is not an intangible asset. Intangible assets need to be identifiable. And, but here we've got unidentifiable assets. That's what goodwill is. That's where we, assets is where we expect some future benefits. We're expecting some future benefits from unidentifiable assets. We can't, we can't separate out from the business the, this aspect. Quite a few people think goodwill is, is um, customer, good customer relationships and so forth. And that can be quite a, quite a part of goodwill, but it's not limited to that. It can be a whole range of factors. 
that lead to a company having goodwill. Customer confidence, quality management, favourable location. For example, Roman Healthcare has a lot of sites that are well located in terms of retirement villages. They need to be near where people, um, you know, basically middle class areas or, or, or upper middle class areas in cities where people will be moving in. They need manufacturing efficiency might be another factor, good employee relations, market share might have a substantial market share. So there can be a lot of factors that lead to a company being able to extract abnormal profits. Roman Healthcare is certainly able to do that. It's able to extract a lot of profits. Roman Healthcare has zero goodwill in its balance sheet. It has none, zero. But it has a lot of a lot of future benefits from unidentifiable assets going on in the business, and its market cap six and a half bill, where its equity total equity is only about two. But this is what goodwill is: it's unidentifiable assets. Goodwill is not an intangible asset. Some people can get a bit confused with goodwill and think it's part of equity, but it's an asset, and it's and it's not an intangible asset. Dividends. Dividends are a distribution of cash or other assets or of a company's own shares to its shareholders. So dividends can be in a number of different forms, but they're payments from a company to its shareholders. And the most common is cash dividends. And uh, Ryman Healthcare had cash dividends of a bit over $100 million last year. Oh, there it is, $108.5 million dollars. Which isn't bad when you think that the shareholders have only ever put in 33 <laughs> and they're getting back three times as much as they collectively put in each year in cash. Now, other comprehensive income. Now, AASB uh, 101 Power 7 covers this. Other comprehensive income comprises items of income and expenses including reclassification adjustments, that are not recognised in the profit or loss. They're not included in the income statement. They're not revenue and expenses in the income statement. And so, as required or permitted by other Australian accounting standards. Examples of the components of other comprehensive income are included in AESB 107, Para 7. I think I've got it here. So I'll go down to Para 7. There it is there, page seven. Other comprehensive income, as I was described in the slide, and then they give lots of examples, some examples of potential types of other comprehensive income. So if you're wondering what other comprehensive income is, there's some examples of it there. There's also a really good video on this where we look at the comprehensive income as part of a, one of the short videos. And um, I think I cut part of that video out and linked it into the study guide as well. So you need to be on top of all these basic elements of accounting in, in this introductory subject. So you can see there's that other comprehensive income, all sorts of various items, and you can see that um, foreign exchange translation gains and losses are there, um, and also, you know, when you're consolidating your accounts across uh, different countries, those sorts of translation uh, gains and losses are included, plus a whole range of other factors, you can see. And uh, particularly some of the, the gains and losses from um, revaluing various items of property, plant and equipment, and intangible assets to fair value is a key area. You see another comprehensive income. And the other comprehensive income, they go into reserves, they don't go into retained earnings. Now, equity is a very is special, um, not just because its accounting treatments are so complex and they change depending on the type of business structure, but equity also has its own financial statement. 
So, you know, Maria really likes cash. She likes the cash flow statement. So cash has its own financial statement as an asset. But equity, it has its own financial statement as well. So equity is pretty special. And um, just as we're interested in what's happening with the cash, and that's why we're interested in the cash flow statement, as equity investors, we're very interested in the equity. This represents the um, measures of value and value creation, but value in the um, accounts. And so we're particularly interested in looking at how equity has changed in a period. And the statement of change in equity gives some good insights into um, what's happening with the very, not just with total equity, but with the different, with issued capital and also the various types of reserves, including retained earnings. So we'll look at Ryman Healthcares. Have a look. It's a long way to go. Here we are. Here's the statement of change in equity. I'll zoom it in. So here we have the consolidated statement of changes in equity. And some people when you're first getting used to financial statements, say in Active 0559, this can seem like the most nerdy one, you know, because it's got multiple columns. It's sort of not quite set out the same way. But you can see total equity is on the right-hand side, and just like the other financial statements, it's showing two years' worth figures. The pre in, in the case of Ryman Healthcare, the previous year, which is the 2018 year, that's shown in the top half, and the current year is shown in the bottom half. And they highlight uh, this bottom half as being the current year, just as they do in the income statement balance sheet with that presentation. So this is the current year. A little bit nerdy because it's sort of set out this way. But here's the total. It's gone from 1.9 billion to 2.17 billion. And then it also shows the balances of each of these items. And you can see how we've got issued capital. An issued capital is completely unchanged. They haven't raised any capital in the last 20 years. So it's been 33.3 million each year. And you can see that here, no changes. But then when we look at the asset revaluation reserve, for example, which is one of the key reserves for Ryman Healthcare, that's 233 mil. You can see that did change during the year. It didn't change the previous year, but they, they, did, they uh, revalued their... Um, uh, property plant, uh, their uh, yeah, property plant equipment, or was it their, their investment properties? The investment properties, I think, about twenty four million. Some years that's a very substantial figure. In 2017 it was fifty six million, and then you can see that um, the, uh, the some other reserves here. We've got the interest rate. I'm having trouble reading that uh, reserve, and then the uh, foreign. Ex Exchange, the foreign translation reserve, and there, and you can link these back to the comprehensive income statement. And then there's the uh, treasury stock, so you can see they've bought some shares in themselves. They're doing that because they're buying shares, and then um, when they vest, they they, they transfer them to uh, employees. And here we've got retained earnings. And you can see this is the big item for Roman Healthcare: one point seven. Billion. And you can see that it's increased by the trap by the profit and total comprehensive income for the year. So it's and then it's uh, paid out some dividends, 108. And then it shows the total figures. So there's quite a lot of information here about what's happening with all the different movements of the different elements of equity. And you can see how equity is developing in the firm. Now, there's no goodwill in the balance sheet for Ryman's because it has never purchased any other company. The only way you're allowed to show goodwill, and as when we've looked at goodwill, is when you acquire another company, if you pay more than its net assets at fair value. But Ryman's has never bought another company. Its, its strategy is to build its own. It just builds its own retirement villages. And so the goodwill that it has developed over the years within its existing business is not reflected in its balance sheet. 
Now we come to the other key area that we're going to look at today is investments in other companies. So we saw how we account for equity um, in, the, in our own business, which is we have two parts, or is it three parts to equity, issued capital and reserves, with retained earnings being the key area of reserves. But there's also a lot of complexity in how we account for investments in other companies. And every listed company I've ever come across and every medium-sized private company I've ever come across has investments in other companies. Significant. Uh, it's a significant area of accounting. And so all of our companies will have this. So investments in other companies can be treated as short-term investments and we can have short-term investments in all sorts of things, and then long-term investments. And we'll be looking at the three methods of accounting for long-term investments, cost method, equity method, and consolidations. And we'll also be looking at the West Farmers balance sheet. What was that page in West Farmers? We'll go to page 14. I can just type that in. So this is West Farmer's balance sheet. Page six. Page six. I just can't read it from here. Oh, no, I think I've got that wrong on the slide. The, um, oh, here we go. So small. Martin, if you want to zoom it, just when you hover your mouse there, right down the bottom right-hand corner in the middle, he has got the plus. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's still, it's, it's still not great for me to see from a distance. No, it is very small. <laughs> I'm just dumb. Now, here we go. Here is our associates and joint arrangements. So here is um, West Farmers. They've got lots of investments in other companies. I'll just get closer to it. And um, you can see it's got 3.3 Bell Investments and Associates. It's also got some joint ventures. And then it lists them all. So your, your firm will also list them. Ryman's just has wholly owned subsidiaries. But here they've got a whole lot of companies, and then they give their ownership. So they've obviously sold these ones. And these, is, they've got 24.8 and all these other different proportions. And they've got a whole lot of 50 percenters. And then they've got some other ones. They're into sodium cyanide, which sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? Maria, how could you like a company that's in sodium cyanide? I just don't know, you know. And then, um, and you can see all the others. You said coals. See how they've owned 15% of coals? They've sold it down. It's floated it a while ago, but they kept 15%. And then you can see all the other um, percentages. So they've disclosed all these various um, associates and, and joint ventures that they've got. And they amount to around $3 billion. So in each of your firms, you'll be able to have a look at what investments they have in other companies, various entities. Now, companies can have short-term investments. That's where they've got a bit of extra cash floating around. They want to get some extra return, get a bit of a return on it, but they are only looking to hold it for less than a year for a short-term investment. They can invest in shares, you know, in other companies, commercial notes, short-term bank deposits and money market investments, various types. And it's the management's intention to keep it for less than one year. And also, they don't have any intention to influence the operations or policies of that organisation that's issuing securities. They're just trying to get a bit of extra return on some cash that they've got sitting around. And so it's a current asset. It'll be the lower of cost or market value. And, it, and they'll receive, so they'll value it on that basis, on cost or lower of cost of market. And the dividends interest received... and. It's usually included as other income in some way from short-term investments. So my question here is, how do short-term investments differ to cash and cash equivalents? 
we saw that the cash flow statement shows cash and cash equivalents in the balance sheet. Um, what are these short-term investments? How do they differ from cash? So I'll just get you to answer that. What do you think? How does this differ to cash? In other words, what's cash and how does this differ? I'll give you 30 seconds to answer this one. Just type in something. What do you think? How do you think it differs? Short-term investments can often be, you know, first deposits earning interest and so forth. So they can also be shares. How are they differ to cash and short term oh, no submission. Just throw or just throw out the thoughts. Or you might say they're the same thing. How is cash and cash equivalents different to short-term investments? How would you know the difference if you ran into them in a dark alley? Let's have a look. Has anybody had a crack at it? We've got one. How about a few others? Anybody else got something to say? Maria, would you like to discuss the first one? We'll wait for, as we get through more, hopefully. Yeah, sure. So we've got the first response is short-term investments might pay a dividend. They are not a guaranteed return on sale. So they said it's not a guaranteed return? Yeah, upon sale. That's right. So there's some risk. That's the key difference. Cash and cash equivalents... Well, cash, there is no risk. Cash is cash. It's in the bank. It's, that's considered. Obviously, the banks could fail and everything, but if the banks start failing, that's probably the least of your problems is the cash in the bank. The, uh, there's a lot of other stuff going on that's not good. But um, so cash and cash equivalents are defined as they can be, um, they can be, uh, they can be sort of uh, up to 30 days or 60 days sort of um, uh, financial instruments, but where their value is not at risk. So there's always a slight risk with, um, with say, money market instruments in the, sh in the very short term, but it's negligible. But short-term investments do involve risk. Say you've invested in listed shares in a company um, as a short-term investment, you, you might be just, you might... Um, just be buying 5% or 1% of a company or half a percent of a company, you're not intending to influence it in any way, but you're just parking some cash there, well, that could go up or down. So you've got some risk. It's not cash. It's, it's, um, it's uh, you know, it's, it, you can't convert it into cash at a risk-free sense in the future. It, when, you, when you liquidate that investment, it, it, its value might, be, might go up or down. So did you read out the other one? Um, the second one is cash is more liquid than short-term investments. And I guess liquid. That, that uh, considers the, or it's, it's developing into the element of risk because of its liquidity. Yeah, liquidity, short-term investments can be very, very liquid. Say you've got, a, 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 say you've bought a few shares in a listed company, you can just sell it tomorrow and get the money. So it's, it, that can be very liquid. And if you've got money in the, say you've got 12 month or a six month um, money market instrument, you know, that you can just sell it on the, on the wholesale money market like that. So a lot of short term investments are just as liquid, if you like, you know, very, very liquid. And so in terms of cash, the liquidity is not really that much different for many of them. It could be in some cases, but uh, the main dif the difference is risk. There's some risk with the short-term investments and, and it's negligible with cash. So you can sort of treat cash as cash, unbalanced state. All right, so that's where the cash and short-term investments distinction fits in. Now the long-term investments. The distinction between a short-term investment and a long-term investment is that management intent, it's management's intention to keep it for more than one year. They may not, things may change, but their intention so in terms of being an accountant, if, if management intend to keep it for more than a year, 
it's a long-term investment. If it's a long-term investment, we'll, we will account for it um, one of three ways. One is at cost. The second is, is um, using the equity, let's call it the cost method, which is, which is um, valuing it at cost, but it can be revalued periodically. Um, and uh, then equity method and the consolidated method. And before we look at these three me methods, we'll have a look at a short video. And uh, where are they? Here we go. And this is uh, on uh, investments if in other companies. If you are wondering how we account for investments in other companies, this video will give you an introduction to this area of accounting. So you will have a foundation to build on when you study this area in more detail later in your degree. Long-term investments are investments where management intend to keep the investments for more than one year. They can include shares of other companies, property and financial instruments. We will focus on long-term investments that involve investing in the shares of other companies that are associated companies or subsidiary companies. These investments are accounted for using the equity or consolidated methods. The equity method is used when a long-term investment involves investing in an associated company. An associated company is where the investing company has significant influence over, but not control of, the investee company. Where an investing company holds 20% or more of the shares in an investee company, the existence of significant influence is presumed, unless there is clear evidence to the contrary. And where the investing company holds less than 20% of the shares in an investee company, it is presumed there is no significant influence, unless there is clear evidence to the contrary. Where the equity method is used, the investment is initially recorded at cost in the balance sheet. When the associated company makes a profit, the investor company increases the value of its assets by their percentage share of the profit of the associated company. Dividends received from the associated company reduce the carrying amount of the investment. And the investor's share of the investee's profit or loss is recognised in the investor's income statement. For those situations where the investor company parent controls the investee company subsidiary, we use the consolidation method. A parent company controls a subsidiary when it is exposed or has rights to variable returns from its involvement with the investee and has the ability to affect those returns through its power over the investee. This is the case when a parent has more than 50% of the shares in an investee company. If a firm has 50% or less of the shares in an investee company, it is a matter of judgment whether the firm controls the investee company. When the consolidation method is used, consolidated financial statements are prepared for each of the four financial statements by adding up the financial statements of each company in a group into a single set of consolidated financial statements. There is a lot of complexity to doing this, 
and you will study this in detail in Act 19061, Advanced Financial Accounting. For further information on investments in other companies, go back to Chapter 8, Section 8.4 in the Study Guide and also review the equity weekly questions. Also answer, write and rate questions on equity in PYs. Great. So that's the, another one of the short videos and uh, encourage you to be looking at these each week. And that's a good one to go back to. You need to have a good grip of those key concepts um, because you'll need that as a foundation for when you study in detail the, cons the accounting treatments, which are complex. So, we, so there are three methods. One is the cost method for less than 20%, where you own less than 20% of the shares in another company. Um, then the presumption is that you don't um, have significant influence. And unless, it's, unless you do, unless it's clear that you do, and then you could use the equity method. But in typically, we own less than 20% of a company, you know you might own 1% or 2%, you use the cost method. It's a non-current asset. You put in the cost of the acquisition of those shares. You can revalue those shares periodically to fair value. And dividends received are revenue. So you may have some of that in your in your firm's accounts. There may be some some dividends received in the revenue, probably in the footnote. So that's the cost method. It's relatively straightforward, but the equity method is where we have significant influence, but not control. Some people say, well, what's the difference between significant influence and control? Well, when control is, you know you've got control. When you've got control, you know you've got control. <laughs> And significant influence means you've got you've got some, you've got sort of you've got a hearing, but you don't control. And it's um, it's presumed if you've got twenty percent or more of the shares, you've got significant influence, unless there's evidence to the contrary. And uh, it's quite possible you may not have significant influence with twenty percent or more. And, uh, and when we get to the uh, consolidated method, you'll see when we talk about control, the presumption's around 50%, more than 50%. But we can control a company with less than 50%, and, uh, and, you, and you may not have significant influence at 20, but that's the presumption unless it's clearly not. Power, this is all about power, significant influence, control, different levels of power. And power is one of those things you know when you've got it and you know when you haven't. I remember um, in my private equity days, we, we bought 25% of a listed company uh, called Restaurant Brands in New Zealand. And it had the master franchises for Pizza Hut and, um, uh, and uh, KFC and, um, and Starbucks in New Zealand. And uh, so we, we bought 25%. We did, had, did a little raid on the, in the share market and picked up all the, all the institutions pretty well. The next biggest investor had about three or 4%. So we bought 25. So when we did it, I rang up the chairman and I said, oh look, you know, I'd like to have a, can we have a meeting? And he said, yeah, yeah, everyone would suit. So I said, oh, no. and so we rang. So I went to meet the chairman and he said to me, oh, well, Martin, what do you want to do? You know, do you want me to stay on? Who do you want to put on the board? You know, we had control at 25%, because the next biggest shareholder had 3%, and there's just lots of little shareholders. And so, and so you know, you know you've got control when you've got control. Um, the, and, and, and so, significant influence is when the chairman doesn't say, oh Martin, what directors would you like to have? Do you want me to stay on? That's control. Significant influence is when, they, when you have, have the opportunity to express some opinions about different things. You might be looking for them to supply your company with different types of products, and you might be able to have um, some, some influence, you know, not just a little influence, but some significant influence because of your shareholding. So they're the sort of judgments that are made um, by management and accountants about the power relationships between um, the, the parent, uh, not the, the sorry, the company, and any investee companies that it has. But they, these are the presumptions in the accounting. 
And if you move away from these presumptions when uh, indicating, you need to have sh strong evidence for it. So that's the um, equity method for where we have significant influence in associated companies. Investments are initially recorded at cost in the balance sheet, just as we did with the cost method. But with the associated companies, when it makes a profit, so we don't get the dividend, it just makes a profit. We don't get any cash, it just makes a profit. If the investor company increases the value, if it makes a profit, say it makes a profit of uh, $100 million, then the investor company will increase the value of its asset by its percentage share of the profits. So if it owns 20% of the company and the company's made $100 million, that's $5 million as its share of profits, and so you would revalue, increase the value of that investment in that company by that $5 million, the percentage share of profits. And when the associated company pays a dividend, so say it paid a dividend of a million dollars to, to us in, on our investment, then we would reduce that um, investment by the amount of dividends we received, which is our percentage share of the dividend. So that's the equity method. You need to understand that, those key concepts because you'll be, you'll be exploring the intricacies of some of the accounting treatments in these. You can see that, that um, uh, West Farmers, when we looked at its footnote, it had a lot of associates. It had a number of associates where it owned 50%. So it was saying it, just, it had significant influence, not control at 50%. And, um, and that was probably because somebody else had 50%. And they, may, um, and, and they probably are treating it as significant influence too. So... Equity method, non-current asset, you put it in at original cost and then you keep revaluing it based on its share of profits and you deduct any share of dividends received. So that's the equity method. And so quite a few of you, probably 75% of listed companies have associated companies like West Farmers do. Ryman Healthcare has no associated companies, it only has subsidiaries and it only has wholly owned subsidiaries as well. So where we own more than 50%, more than 50% of the shares, it's presumed that we control it. And that's not a, that's, that's pretty logically obvious, really. If you've got more than 50% of the shares, you can tell that company, you can point the directors, you can point the staff, you can do anything you like. But if you've got less than 50%, it's a judgment as to whether you control it. So in that example with, with the restaurant brands, we would control the company because we had, to, even though we had 25%, because of the nature, the, all the other shareholders were so dispersed. As an aside, even though we actually did control the company, we didn't appoint all the directors. We kept, uh, we, we gave them a lot of independence. We were a private equity firm. We went into running the business, um, and uh, there were there were we, there was we had a, we had. And so we, we decided that we had significant influence in that business, not control in practice, and we didn't consolidate it. Or at least that's uh, actually what we did was we tried that actually, but in discussions with the accountants, um, uh, um, you know, if, if we'd structured it in, in terms of that investment being wholly in one fund, um, they would have, they would have uh, perhaps argued that there was quite a lot of evidence that we did control it. In fact, there probably was actually quite a lot of evidence, but because we structured in such a way that we had multiple funds owned by different people, we were able to argue that it was uh, an associate. And so these are the sort of judgments. And as accountants, we need to ensure that the accounts are, into, uh, are showing what's really going on. Now, if we have more than 50%, we have a group of companies. All of our firms will be a group of companies. We will have some subsidiaries. Everybody's, every list of company I've ever come across, most mid-sized companies have subsidiaries. Group of companies is the economic entity. That's what we're interested in. Your accounts show their group accounts when you're looking at, at firms. And this is control. An investor controls an investee company. So the investor is the guy, the, the powerful one. The investee is the one that's been controlled. 
An investor controls an investee when it is exposed or has rights to variable returns from its involvement with the investee. So it's, in other words, it's, it's a risky investment. It's, it's got returns that could vary um, depending on a lot of factors and, and the investor company has the ability to affect those returns through its power over the investee. So in other words, that's, that's, that's control. You can influence the overall returns of the business through, um, you know, you have that ability. So that could arrange for all of the things, but you can appoint the directors, you can, you can appoint the staff, you can tell it what to do and it'll do it. So that's what you'll have with your subsidiary companies. And you can see what subsidiary companies you've got. And so for the, for the consolidated method, we show consolidated accounts. So we don't do that with the equity method. We just have it at cost and we increase it with the percentage share of profits, reduce it with the dividends. But here we do line by line consolidation. You know, we crunch the, <laughs> the accounts into one. So each of the companies has their own accounts, and, but we present them as a consolidated single entity, even though legally they're all separate companies. So in other words, the four financial statements add up each of the company's financial statements into a group of accounts. And we discussed that a little bit in Act 11.0592. So here's Ryman's 2019 accounts. They often have some very, I mean, how could you not like this lady? And you know, the caring, they'll have all this sort of stuff going on. And, um, what page do I have? footnote that shows all the um, all the uh, subsidiaries. I think it's here it is, that was it there. And then I'll zoom it. There we go. So Ryman Healthcare has a whole lot of subsidiaries. There, there they are, they're listed all out. Your firm will list them all out. And they're all 100% owned. And there they all are. So all the retire not all, yeah, all the retirement villages are owned by a separate company. And there's some a, a few other subsidiary companies there. And so there they are. And so Ryman's annual report is a consolidation of all, all those separate companies have their own accounts. They have accounts for all sorts of items, of assets, liabilities, equity, revenue and expenses. They're all put together. And that process of putting them together is something you'll study in advanced financial accounting. So, so when you look at your accounts, Ryman's doesn't have this, but a lot of yours will. Um, if you own a subsidiary company where you don't have 100%, you'll have some non-controlling interests, both in your income statement and balance sheet. In the balance sheet, the non-controlling interest is, is, relates to those shares that are owned in the subsidiary companies of your firm that are not owned by your firm, they're owned by somebody else. And so, they, so part of the profits of your group entity are actually um, uh, in, you know, other people, the non-controlling interests have an interest in those profits and also in terms of um, the net assets they've got a, They've got, in terms of the equity, they've got a, um, a non-controlled non interest on some of the equity of the old, whole group. The parent doesn't own all the equity. Now, assets and liabilities, intercompany balances are offset against each other. So typically in a group, the companies trade with each other. That's why you have a group. So they've got, they're, they're interacting with each other. There might be accounts receivable between the parent and subsidiary. Um, and, uh, and so all of those interactions between companies within a group 
under, under consolidation are removed. <laughs> so you can see there's a little bit of work involved in this. So all the intercompany balances say in accounts receivable are removed. So when you're looking at and, and every item, so if you're looking, for example, at accounts receivable for Ryman Healthcare or any other company that's a group of companies, it's only the accounts receivable that they're you know that are owed to them by outside parties. It doesn't include amounts that are owed to the parent by a subsidiary, for example. Why, and um, why would we do that? Also, the parent's investment in the subsidiary is eliminated as well, so you won't see anything about that. So why do we do that? Why do we go through this complex process with a group to eliminate company balances between companies when consolidating their accounts? I'll give you a chance to answer that question. Why do we do that? When we're looking at our group accounts, how come we don't have all the intercompany transactions? For example, accounts receivable or accounts payable and a whole heap of other potential, potential intercompany transactions. Why do, why do we take them out when we consolidate? What do you think? You'd have to say, I have absolutely no idea. That's all right. But you might have a thought. Why do you think? The reason we're introducing this too is because for you to interpret the accounts of your firm to understand its equity, you need to understand how we account for these um, particular consolidations, have some sense of what you're looking at when you're looking at a group accounts. So let's have a look. We've got one response. Just keep them coming in. Yeah, it's you don't have to say, oh my goodness me, do I have to study consolidation sometime in the future? It is, it is seriously complicated. At the, Maria, would you like to comment on some of the comments? Oh, look, I can try, Martin. <laughs> you do so um, well. You do so well. Why do we remove intercompany balances between companies when consolidating their accounts? So we have two responses. This first one says, to save time because ultimately they are all accounted for under the parent company. Oh, what, what, back up, back up. This, number one, this does not save time. This is like a nightmare job, right? When you've got to go through, you've got to go through line by line. You know how big some of these companies are? This is not fun, and not for the faint hearted. And certainly accountants doing the consolidations will have had a bit of experience in, in, in accounting before they tackle it. So it's, it really adds a lot of complexity. And what was their other comment? Um, the second one is... No, no, the first one. The first one. I don't, no, that was... So save time because ultimately they are all accounted for under the parent company. Well, they're not. They're not, you see. We're, we're taking them out. Say accounts payable, accounts receivable. There's a transaction going on between the parent and the... Say the, say the, the subsidiary owes $100,000 to the parent. In their own accounts... The parent will have accounts receivable of 100,000 and the subsidiary in its accounts will have accounts payable of 100,000. We take them out. They're gone. They're not in the consolidated accounts, even though they are in the individual company accounts. There's a lot of stuff taken out. So it's not, it doesn't sort of, it's no longer there. It's gone. But anyway, so that's, so those two, so they're interesting comments, but the, in fact, we don't put it all in. There's a whole heap. We take a whole heap out. We take them out. <laughs> Those intercompany transactions, they're not in the group accounts. Um, and, uh, and it isn't simple either. You'll see that when you study it in the Fungi. Maria, the second one, what was the next one? The second one, there's three now. So the second one is, because it would be an extremely long annual report, including all this information, consolidate... Extremely... Sorry, keep going. Consolidating seems like it is supposed to make it easier to interpret the parent company's overall business realities. Oh, that's a good point, that last one. That's interesting, isn't it? Well, does it make it simpler? I mean, have you seen how long our company's accounts are? They're all consolidated. They're mighty big, typically, aren't they? They're not that simple. Some are a little bit simpler than others, but they have a lot. It, it, 
it potentially could simplify it a little bit, but typically what it does is just reduce the balances on various items. But it could make it slightly simpler. That's true. And But the other one, what, what was the second part of that comment again? Uh, consolidating seems like it is supposed to make it easier to interpret the parent company's overall business realities. That's right. That is a really good point. That is exactly spot on. You see, we're interested in looking at the consolidated group <laughs> as an entity, and that entity might owe money to some other parties as accounts payable, right? They're to external parties. We're not interested in what it owes to itself if you think of it as a single entity. Ryman Healthcare is, we think of it, in the group accounts, we think of it as a single entity. I don't care if the parent owes some money to the subsidiary or vice versa, who cares? We don't, we don't want to do that. We want to know that the money that's owed is owed externally or payable externally and so on for the different items. Um, so that's a, that's a really good insight and so um, when you're looking at a group accounts, you're looking at it as if it's a single entity. And just as, it, just as we're not interested in how things transfer within departments or something in a business, it's the same here. But the point is they all keep their own separate accounts and they'll have all sorts of things in them that, that get eliminated when we group it. Keep going. And Maria, do you want to keep moving on? Yep. So... The third one is to keep them as separate entities regardless of investment. Could you say that again? So to keep them as separate entity regardless of investment. Well, their accounts are separate. They've got, they've got their own company accounts and everything, but we're putting them together. So they are interact. That's consolidation is putting them in line by line and pretending it's one big company. Um, and the last comment, Maria? is for easier interpretation of account balances. Yeah, in other words, we look at it as if it's a single entity. So that's right. So we have um, probably, you know, I think I might be able to, I'll deal with this very briefly. Goodwill on consolidation. So what happens is the goodwill that you might have in your firm's accounts, anybody who's got goodwill, it's because you've purchased another company and controlled it and you've paid more than the fair value of its, of its net assets. In other words, you add up the fair value of everything, of all its assets and liabilities, and you've paid more than the fair value of its net assets. If you do that, you can record this asset called goodwill. Not an intangible asset, but it's unidentifiable. It's not related to anything specific. And... Uh, it's an, an goodwill, non-current asset on the consolidated balance sheet. So that's something that you can see if you've got it. Ryman's has none because it's never acquired anything. It's amortised over time against consolidated net profit. 3.1, I think it has, is it 3.1 million or billion? I might have that wrong. It has a fit, I think it's probably, I don't know actually whether I got that wrong. But it, it has a, it could well be a bit, and it has quite a lot. It's a difference between the amount paid for a company and the fair value of the net assets. And you could ask yourself, why would a company pay more than the fair value of the net assets? But we won't go into that at the moment. So, consolidated income statements, it combines the revenue and expenses of each company in a group. It eliminates the intercompany transactions, sales and purchases between companies within the group. It deducts amortisation of goodwill. It, it, um, when carrying amounts of goodwill, like any other non-currents, exceed the recoverable amounts, we can impair, so there's impairment expenses around that, and we can deduct profits and losses attributable to non-controlling interests. So you can have a look at your own companies and see where the goodwill might have come from. We haven't got very long, but we'll do the minute paper. What was the most important thing you learned today? And you might say absolutely nothing, or it might be some specific thing. And secondly, what questions still remain unanswered? Just got one minute. And I need to move to the next one. Maybe. We looked at equity today. What was the most important thing you learned?
30 seconds. What questions still remain unanswered? Response. Two responses. While the response is still coming in, we'll, we'll spend a minute or two going over them. But also next week will be our review week and um, we'll be pulling together various elements. You'll also have some chances to discuss and raise questions that you might have. And um, you've got the exam advice. You can see the topics that we're focusing, that we're examining this term. And uh, and you know, if you if you started to think about the exam a bit more, you can ask some questions around it. That's next week, and we'll be pulling together the various topics that we've looked at. Now, Maria, would you like to take us quickly through what was the most important thing you learned today? Yep, we have five submissions. So, why we remove intercompany accounts consolidating, and earnings reserves and consolidations, Top equity and how we account for it. The importance of understanding all the basic elements of accounting to make learning the more involved content easier. No questions unanswered. Thanks. I learned a lot about equity, goodwill, dividends and investments, etc. And the last one, goodwill means someone paid more than the valuation of a given entity. It doesn't seem like it's necessarily a good thing. I still have mixed feelings regarding this concept. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that's good. All right, let's let's have a look at uh, what questions. Are there any questions? Not yet. So if you've got any questions, you can put them up or just... Um... Yeah, so equity can seem quite complex, and that's because it is. It's a very complex area of accounting. We've just sort of laid the groundwork for you to see the key areas. Um, we shall issue capital and reserves getting a bit of a feeling for what reserves are. Reserves are not bashed back by cash. There's no asset, <laughs> there's equity. They're, the, they're the, um, the value added in the business that's been retained in the business and hasn't been distributed to shareholders. And we looked at, we looked at goodwill and dividends, other comprehensive income, we particularly looked at goodwill, how goodwill is what it is. It's an asset, it's not equity, but it's it comes about when we acquire other businesses and pay more than their fair value of their net assets. And then we looked at investment in other companies, which is a complex area, but it, it, is, it is very common that, that our companies will invest in other companies. And so the accounting treatments are, are, are central to understanding accounting. And, uh, and, the, and you'll have lots of opportunity to look into the complexity. So I think people have got to comment a bit about that. Any questions, Maria? We have nothing on there, Martin. <laughs> That's excellent. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I think we're about to finish our time. And, uh, uh, and I look forward to uh, next week where we'll be doing a review and, um, and, and happy to discuss elements of your study for the exam. <laughs> It literally did. You couldn't have timed it any better, Martin. Just <laughs> on mine. So that's how to be finished. <laughs> Who's on there? Rocky. Rocky.